So, caching. The idea behind caching, in general, and I realize now the only light in this room is coming from this, so now that I've gone to a dark slide, it's dark in here. So, sorry about that. Um, the whole idea behind caching is get stuff that's used frequently and store it closer to you. So, think about this big old file cabinet that you got here, that you got lots of files in there, and you happen to be working on some piece of information from one of those files, and you know you're going to be working on it for the next three or four days. You're probably going to take that file out and leave it on your desk nearby, so you can just keep grabbing it. You're not going to look something up in it, close it, walk it all the way back to the file cabinet, stick it back in, go back to your desk at work, then realize, oh, gee, I need something else, go back. So getting that data and getting that information close and storing it closely is generally what caching is all about. <clears throat> so we'll talk about some specifics there. Drupal caching. <clears throat> There's some built-in things you can do. Uh, Drupal has built-in caching. You just go into the performance settings and turn it on. If you're running a production site, go turn that on. If you don't know if it's on, when you get home tonight, go turn that on. Because it will make a massive amount of difference in the performance of your site. Issue with the built-in caching, it, what it does is it, it actually builds the whole page, stores the contents of the page in the database, so all of the work of assembling the modules and figuring out what's there and doing all the calculations and doing all of that doesn't have to be done for every single visitor. It does it once, holds it for a period of time, keeps it there, serves that right out of there, and then deletes it later on. So it doesn't do all that work. Now the problem is, it only works for anonymous users. Anytime someone logs in, the cache is no longer being used for them. So you'll hear sometimes people talk about, yeah, my site was fine until people started logging in, and now they're complaining that it's taking a long time to load. That built-in caching, most sites are mostly anonymous users. Unless you've got a membership forum that lots of people are logged in and they're constantly using, your, your, your usage profile is probably most people are, are, are anonymous. You're running a blog, like a personal blog, and you don't require signups to, to comment, and you allow anonymous con comments, almost all your traffic's anonymous cache, uh, anonymous, and you're going to get a huge boost from turning on the built-in caching. And it's really easy to do. You just click the button and boom, it's on and it's just running. Forget it, don't have to even worry about it. He, he just suggested everyone go home and turn it on. How about turn it on? Absolutely. So that's on production sites. In development, I'd suggest you leave it off because you don't want to see what the most recent, what the cache copy of the page is. Because if, if you're, if you make a change and now, okay, let me see what the anonymous user sees. Wait, it's not there anymore. It's because it's not actually assembling that page anymore. It's serving it right out of cache. So on a development server, leave caching off. On a production server, turn caching on. On that same page where you turn on the built-in caching, there's also a CSS aggregation thing. What that does is all of the style sheets, every module you install, almost all of them include a style sheet on your page. Go look at the source of your page if you've got a couple of dozen modules installed, and you'll see this big old long list of include this style sheet, include that style sheet, include this style sheet. There's a couple of issues with that. Your browser, the, the user's browser is keep making requests back and forth, so it's, there's a performance issue on the front end for them, it's having to make more requests. There's also a performance issue on, on, for the server. What, serving one request, a lot easier than serving 50 little requests. So your server is going to take that one request, it's going to serve it out, it's done with it. <coughs> Again, so what the, the CSS, aggregation, CSS aggregation does is it reads all of those CSS files that all the modules are putting together, and it just combines them in one file, stores it on the file system, and just serves it right out of there. If you're doing development, don't turn on CSS aggregation on your development server. It will drive you insane trying to figure out why the CSS change you made is not showing up. I've spent two hours trying to figure out why I keep making this change and it's not happening and, and debugging CSS is hard enough already and why I keep moving this thing 10 pixels up and it's not moving. I must have some other rule that's cascading and causing this problem and it's because I had CSS, kind of CSS aggregation turned on and turned it off and hey look, there's all my changes that I made and now I've completely screwed up my CSS. <laughs> because I've been trying to fix this problem that didn't really exist. <laughs> Block cache is a third party module. Definitely install and use this one. It is great. So what Block cache does, I guess definitely install and use it if you have lots of blocks on your site. If you're, install, if you're putting in lots of blocks, Block cache is fantastic. 
What block cache does is all the little calculations that get done to build each block, like what are the most recent forum posts, what are the top comments, and all of those little things that, that happen, and all those gets to the database. It takes those blocks, it compiles those into to single little chunks, and it stores it. The great thing about this is it works even for users that are logged in, because you're storing individual chunks instead of the entire page. The reason, by the way, built-in caching doesn't work for a logged in user is if I served a cache page to Ben, and he was logged in, and then somebody else came along and hit my site, they'd see Ben's page. So that's why it's turned off. So the, the block cache, because it's caching discrete pieces of information, which discrete chunks, it's a little bit more efficient as far as the, the anonymous users versus logged in users. And you can actually specify when you say, I want to cache this block. So you install it, you go into your blocks, now you can say this block should be cached, this one shouldn't. I really, really need the most recent information on this block. I don't care about the database yet. Go ahead and serve that. With, with the block that you're actually caching, you can specify when the cache gets deleted. So when does, that, when does that file on your desk get put back in there and get fetched again later? When does all that rebuilding happen? It can happen either when content is added, it can happen based on, I believe, time, so after a certain period of time, add it, and then you can also do it per user. So you can say this block is user specific. So the fact that they have a, a private message and I'm using the private message block Every user gets its own, it gets their own cache, and so it's only having to calculate that for for uh, once for that user for their, their session, and then it gets changed. Block cache is fantastic, and it, it takes sites that are dying under load and and turns things around. It's great. So it sounds like even if I'm not a new developer, I can use block cache module, check off a couple check boxes, click save, and it would help me, right? Yes. Now, you're, you're going to need to think a little bit about whether or not this information really needs to be created for each user. Is this a per user? Is this a site-wide cache? And you're going to have to, to know a little bit about what that, that block is normally outputting. Is the data that it sends out something that's user-specific, or is it something that is, is it's, you know, for the whole site? And you're also going to need to think about data freshness. How important is it to me that this data is absolutely up to the minute fresh? If you have a little count thing on your site that says, you loaded this page at this time, and you cache it, but that time's always going to be wrong. So. Can you specify in the module how long to cache? I believe you can, and I, I'm. I, it's on a block. I can't look at block basis. On a, the the time is on a block per block basis. Yes, all of the settings are at a block per block by block basis. Whether it's user specific, content specific, time. Okay, two questions. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, so for module developers, is there a book that maybe I could tap into to use block cache and actually pre-configure my module's custom blocks to have if block cache is installed? I'm not sure. Okay, fair no, enough. It's not necessary. It's, it's not necessary, but what he's asking, yeah, module developer doesn't have to enable support for it, but what he's asking is, can I pre-configure block cache with a module? Um, that would be excellent, and I have no idea if you can do it. Another question? Um, yeah, I was wondering, because on the site we built recently, um, we were using panels to display our, our, all of our content. Basically. Yes. So instead of using blocks, we're, we're sometimes using panel views. Yeah. Um, some of them are being populated by block content, but other ones are just directly straight out of the view. And I'm wondering, does block cache work with that? Yes, block cache would work with that. It actually intercepts the block request from so as long as panels is using the, the as long as whatever module you're using to pull the block in but is using the API to do it, then it, it will work. And sure. panels does. I'm not sure if it does with panels. I, I'm not sure. Are you using the it. panels or panels two? It's panels two. And okay. It, and it, some of them we're pulling in blocks. I know that. So right. That's what obviously work. But some of them, what we do is we create a view and then we pull it into panels through panels views configuration. Right. And it basically uh, allows you to configure how the view gets displayed per pane that way. Yep. Um, so I'm wondering whether those can be configured. Yeah, it should be, because the way block cache actually works in the interface when you go and look at your, your modules, one of the things about enabling block cache is you'll suddenly have twice as many blocks listed on your admin screen, because it gives you the uncached and the cached version. And you can add the cached version, you can add the uncached, you can add them both if you want. I don't know why you want duplicate content with some of it fresh and some of it cached, but you know, hey, go ahead. So you should be able to add the cached version of that block right from within panels too, and add that. 
And then if your content from the block is site specific and it's not, doesn't need to be done at the user, it's another level of caching that you can do. Panels 2 has a thing called simple cache that every time it pulls the data, it'll store a copy of it and cache that, that data. That is much like the built-in caching. It's not per user, it's, you know, everybody sees the exact same thing, but it is at, the, it is at a smaller chunk level, so each individual piece in the panel, so every content uh, chunk you add into the panel can be cached separately. And that's built into panels? It's built into panels too. It's a, it's a, you'll have to enable the simple, I think you have to enable the simple cache module, but it's part of the panels to download, it's part of the install, it's sitting there in your modules list if you install panels too. And then the last one is advanced cache. So advanced cache is an attempt to take all of those disadvantages of built-in caching, like I can't cache it for, for uh, logged in users and it's not per user and all of that stuff, and it attempts to solve that problem for most users. It solves it for any user that only has one role. So in your Drupal admin, when you create a user, you can assign them to roles. Everybody's in the authenticated user role, right? If you add them, if you create another role and add them to that, advanced cache isn't gonna solve that for you. It works for somebody that's logged in, but doesn't have, they're not an admin, they don't have all these other roles. And what it does is it attempts to take a copy of each generated page per user, store that in the database so it doesn't have to regenerate the page. It works really well. It, it improves site performance tremendously. If you have a lot of users that are editing content, like going in, there's an existing node, and they go and edit that, They're, you're going to run into some, some issues with advanced cache, where Drupal thinks that someone else is editing this content, because advanced cache is just best to fetch to that page. And Drupal say, wait, no, someone else is editing this, you can't edit it, because if I edit it, you edit it, we both save, somebody's changes are lost. And so Drupal, the, the advanced cache makes Drupal think sometimes that some of those pages are being edited by somebody else, even though it's just you. And so your users will get confused. So it works really well if you're talking about comments or, or something like that. The only reason they're logging in is for comments or forum posts. And they can create content, but they're not editing existing content. It starts to get a little hairy when you're editing a lot of content. My understanding of advanced cache is that it has six or seven patches for different four modules. It does. So that's that's another downside to advanced cache. Okay. You don't just install it. I was wondering if you could be more specific about which component you're talking about now, about only if a user is more than one role, then Drupal gets confused. Um, it's the node. It's the the core patch. The core patch to the node object is where that appears to happen. Uh, Advanced cache also conflicts with several other modules. It does. I've never actually gotten it to work on a site that we actually use. It, it's because of what it does, because it's assembling the whole page and storing it, if a module isn't expecting that, if, if, so for instance, caching, any of these caching, built-in caching all the way down to advanced cache, that statistics module, if it's assembling a, a page and sending it, some of those things don't happen. If you've got something embedded in the page that needs to write to the database, that page isn't ever executing. There's, there's no code happening. It's just fetching the static, stores the static HTML and sends it back out. So if you're expecting code to execute, it will cause problems with that uh, it, during, during a module load or during a template load or something like that. If there's any business logic that has to happen in this or in that, you're going to run into issues uh, because it's, it's not serving a, a uh, uh, a program anymore, it's just serving up a static page. It, uh, to install it, you have to install the module and then you get a list of patch files that you have to apply against Core Drupal. There's a patch file for views, there's a patch file for um, a, a couple of other search modules. Taxonomy. Well, the built in search taxonomy users uh, node, I think, are the four for, for the built in, and then there's three or four contributed. There's views, and I don't recall the other ones off the top of my head. Installing a patch file is fairly simple, but it's not like just dropping a file in and you're done. They're, they're, you use a program, dip and patch, that's a, usually a command line program, although there's visual tools for Windows and for Mac and for other things that will do it, that actually take its list of instructions, change this line to say this, and it goes and it reads that, finds that line, and makes those changes. 
So it's not a simple install. It's not a, it's not a panacea and it's not guaranteed to work with your site. That said, if it works for you, it really, really works. It, it's, it's really solid if it does work, but it's something that you really want to, if you do install it, you want to do a lot of testing to make sure that this is not causing other issues with you. Any other questions? Can you summarize the issues? Because on the one hand, you said it really, really works when it works, but what is the determinant of whether it's really, really going to work versus just be a headache in terms of issues? Um, the types of users you have and how, how your roles and permissions are set up is one. Um, and what the other modules and even your template code is expecting to happen when a Drupal page loads are, are really the, the two issues. Uh, because this changes how a Drupal page is loaded. It loads it, it doesn't run any code, it just loads right out of the, the static file. Is there another question? Have you ever used, uh, I hope I'm remembering the name right, Boost? Um, yes. So, curious what your opinion Boost takes everything and writes it to static HTML files on your disk and and stores it there. So, it's it's no you're no longer serving a web app. You're serving HTML pages off off of the server, just like if you hand coded them and uploaded a static file. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with it. We don't use it. Um, in reality, most sites are, are dynamic enough that that starts to fall down. Uh, you know, somebody adds a comment, it doesn't show up. Somebody logs in, it, there's just so many little things that happen with that, that you know, if you're publishing a brochure site that has no logins, and the only person that ever logs in is the admin and content rarely changes, and you're just literally using Drupal so that the dentist's office can change their hours of operation if they need to six months from now, then Boost will probably work for you. Um, if you have any dynamic features at all, it starts to fall down. It's getting better. It's, it's a very, very young module and it's under some, some pretty active development. So I'm, I'm convinced that it will become a solution long term. Uh, it's not something that, that we're using now. And there's a lot of other caching mechanisms, caching models that, that, that are Drupal modules and such that, that we're not talking about here. Um, these are the ones that you're going to run into a lot when you're searching and trying to figure out how to cache and how to, how to speed things up. I love Boost. You love Boost? I have to say I love it. Really? Yeah. If you want to take your site offline for maintenance, install Boost. That's a good point because you can turn your whole site to static, take it offline for maintenance, and then disable Boost when you bring it back up. Yeah. There's a test in the, in the issue queue to fix CSS caching. Yeah. It disables the CSS caching, and if you're going to use Boost, you should use that or, uh, Unless you like unstyled pages. Yeah, okay. And it's in the Boost Yeah. Anything else? What about opcode caching and uncaching? We'll get to that in a minute. So these are things you can install in Drupal without any access to a server at all. 